Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to the Crew 2. You may notice that we are crossing the desert. Mostly. That was a rock. And with me as always, I am joined by... Oh, uh, right Joe. That's still me. So, Joe, do you know what dr car we're driving here? Let's see, uh, this... I'm gonna guess it's a Jeep? No, no, it's not by Jeep. It, it is, uh, an all-terrain kind of vehicle, though. Oh, this is a Hummer, isn't it? Well, you'll be able to see it in... pretty soon. We're getting close to the, uh, off-road headquarters, hence why we're going across the desert here. Wow. And pretty soon I will switch the camera view to an exterior shot. Oh! Oh, oh no! <laughs> Bob! How could you do this to me? <laughs> oh, fuck it. Not just a Hummer, but the most patriotic Hummer you'll ever find. Oh, this is... This is horrendous. <laughs> I, I actively hate this thing. <laughs> oh. It's amazing what the kind of paint jobs you can get for in this game, though. This is a custom job, ain't it? Sort of. I'll get more into that... eventually. But for right now, this here is Tucker. Hi, Tucker. This is the ace for the off-road, uh... discipline. Alright. And your fixer is a guy called Wade. Now... The off-road uh, discipline has sort of an interesting twist to it, because Wade is the asshole, and Tucker is the nice guy. Huh. Also, this is your reward for uh, beating Tucker, a helicopter. This, this entire area seems... Uh... Pretty nice. Yeah, it's got all the basic, same basic booths and um, four disciplines, so you can check out four different kinds of cars. But now let's get started on some of the activities you can do, starting with the rally raid. Oh man, yeah. That's something that, that you didn't really see a lot in games at the time. Still don't. Alright, so this is the Aerial Nomad. Oh, yeah. It's basically a dune buggy. Designed for going off-road. Yeah, I remember seeing the PR material for this thing. It, uh, these things got sent off to a lot of reviewers. Oh? I believe this was in automatic free car that came with one of the updates. Hmm. Like there are some like there's some like that. There are some that uh, you get with the season pass. And there are some that you just get for starting the game essentially. You know, cuz just to get you started. Of course. And there's another sort of dune buggy looking car that uh, I don't drive in this video, but that's the, your starter for the uh, for the off-road discipline. Also, this uh, this particular race is kind of a nice example of uh, the sort of compromises you have to figure out when you're out on a rally raid, because. If you stick with the road, you'll usually go faster, because most cars go faster when they are on the road rather than on the grass or the dirt. Or in this case, the water. Every right. car slows down in the water. So if you can stick to the road, you will go faster, but the road doesn't always go exactly where the, uh, the next waypoints are. So it's sort of a question which way is faster here. Like, you could get lucky, like I just did, 
and find this bit strip of dirt in the middle of the the uh, swampland. This is a pretty interesting setup. Yeah. And also, you've got to deal with all of the uh, the trees because there are clear paths forward, and there are paths full of trees forward. Trees are usually a little more direct, but you know. If you hit one, you will stop. Hmm. Do that. I kind of like this. The rally raid discipline. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's been rally raids in video games before. There was a Qatar series on the PlayStation, but I never tried those. So right now I'm actually downgrading this vehicle so that I can put all the best parts on a different one. So I can show off, you know, multiple uh, vehicles. Huh. And I am showing this off now so that you can see what's going on, but I will be cutting it out when I do it more than uh, a few more times in this video. Like, I've only just now gotten performance level parts good enough to beat the, uh, second difficulty level. And that's another interesting note, that, uh, the initial difficulty level is different for each race. Like, you saw it started at 40 there, there are others that are like 60. But when you hit the second difficulty level hard, it is always 110 every race. Oh man, that's a rough. Three, yeah. Two, and then of course Ace is always max. So, uh, you, uh, you haven't got, got a really well. Ah, crap. Yeah. So this vehicle here is essentially a uh, modded Porsche. Yeah, these things uh, come up whenever they can't get the Porsche license. They just get uh, rough and rough supplies the same model. Yeah. Well, there are Porsches, too. Ooh. This is by a company that specifically takes Porsche bodies and mods them. It's really weird. Mm-hmm. But, uh... So what we're seeing here is basically the car type of Rally Raid vehicle. The first one you saw was the Dune Buggy, which is sort of light, good engine, good traction. This is also light because it's based on a sports car. Crap. But it's also a lot harder to control. But in exchange, it can get a lot faster, especially when you're on the road. Saw me there, just uh, braving the forest. Yeah, made it through there at least. And you saw the arrows there, pointing in two different directions. Whoops. <laughs> and yeah, either one is valid. I mean, obviously one of them is faster, most likely, but... Either one will get you to your objective. And here you can see me uh, making up a hell of a lot of last time in this vehicle. Oh yeah, finally on flat land. Yeah. Just then go. It just uh, keeps on accelerating. Oh yeah. In six gear and counting. Oh, but now we've left the uh, forested part of Utah and we've hit the dunes. Oh, oh boy. Oh. And man, this oh, thing can get air, yeah.
Yeah. Good thing it can because I finally left that objective uh, ghost car in the dust. Yeah, nice. Well, damn. You busted Wade's record good. Too bad he wasn't here to see it. Oh yeah, one thing I have failed to mention is that uh, in the process of beating Tucker to become the ace, you also beat Wade to make him go away forever. Oh, nice. I wouldn't have it any other way, really. See, the, the Red Bull car there, that's the one that you get to start out in off-road. <laughs> well, they are everywhere. Especially in this game, where you get the whole Red Bull catalog. kind of weird to me, especially considering Red Bull actually has, like, uh, people uh, reviewing sports games, including racing games. Hmm. And, like, they've done some pretty good write-ups, even. Well, what we've got right here is another sponsored event, where, wherein you have to drive a Mercedes X-Class truck. And you're a long way from a tow truck. And in this case, it's fine that the uh, that the ghost car has just left me in the dust because I've done this one before, so that is the world record again. Ooh. Well, that clearly wasn't the way to go. Mm. Apparently, I just chose the worst possible path through that particular bit of woods. <laughs> but uh, incidentally, the Mercedes X-Class uh, race here is a little unique in that when you win this race, you get the car. Nice. Oh, right, and you can upgrade it. Yeah. Ah. As opposed to having to buy it and then so that you can upgrade it. This one, it, it is part of the winnings, is getting the truck. I wonder why they didn't do that for all these sponsorships. I don't know. Maybe they made the sponsors pay extra. Oh! Look at all that expanse! Oh yeah, yeah. Good sight lines from up here on the mountain. This is a moment you don't get in a whole lot of racing games. Mm-hmm. But, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, the the car model that you're looking at right now is actually the default model. Mm. I haven't modded this at all, so the weird to know cover on the back with the two tires sticking out of it, that's apparently standard. At least for this... whoops. At least for this version. Mm. Yeah. As is the orange paint job. Yeah, I, I wasn't gonna ask, but I am judging. It's a terrible paint job. I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. It's not mine. Like I said. <laughs> yeah, this part here is tricky, by the way, with all of the bridges. Hmm. And, uh, also, that lake is not traversable. You have to go around. Like, off-road vehicles, rally raid vehicles, they can go in a lot more water than a street race vehicle can. But there is still too much water. And that is too much water. Well, I, I ran into the finish line, but it, it counted at least. You got a corner in there. It's fine. It's fine. Apparently, yeah. It's fine. There we go. There you go. And that is, by the way, the truck type uh, off-road vehicle. Mm -hmm. The truck has mass on its side. So it's not easy to push 
out of the direction you want to go in. Which, uh, when you're going at high speed in this kind of condition, that can be important. Also, you may have noticed, but if a race has a different image on it, that usually means there's something special about it, like a cutscene. Oh man. Are you gonna face a bear? No. We might see one, though. Ooh. So, of course, this is the F-150 Raptor, powered by EcoBoost. <laughs> of course. And yeah, here's what, here's what you can see is different already. We're racing against a real person and not a shadow. Oh. And it just kind of slides off you. Yeah. That was Tucker. The ace. Bye, Tucker. Some talker, huh? Watch yourself, this terrain is tricky. It's easy to get wrecked. And as you can hear, I chose some oddly sedate buffalo. Oddly sedate music. Mm. But I think it's kind of fitting. At least it fits Tucker's personality. Yeah, like, just from his posture, I, I, I kind of felt that they were going for the serious rally personality. And mostly about sportsmanship. It's the journey. Except in this race, it's both. Careful, he's gonna want to stop the race to meditate. He's a hippie, essentially. Dude. Oh. And the reason he goes into the off-road discipline is because he is just as interested in the scenery for real. as he is in beating his opponents. That's fair. That's why he's invited us to this race in particular. It's pretty. Oh crap. Oh. This is not where oh, I wanted no. to go. On the bright side, there's a road down here. There it is. <laughs> this kind of reminded me, I, uh, I saw a recording of uh, uh, the European Rally Championship uh, had an event happening in the Azores. And it, it's a crescent-shaped island, and they went along the top of, the, like, the mountainous ridge, just, that goes all the way along the island. And it's kind of amazing seeing, uh, seeing the top-down shots, because, like, on each, each side of the road is uh, just treacherous precipice yeah. all the way down. Yeah. Hey, here we are. We won. There you are. Two guys in our Ford pickups. If I could go camp. Was a race there. <laughs> Too bad Wade wasn't around to spoil it. I told you the finish was worth it. Was I right, or was I right? By the way, the first time I did this race, I did exactly what the character did: whipped out the camera and took a picture. I think I would too. There's an in-game camera thing you can use. I'll get into that one later too. Nice. Yeah, this is also an unmodded F-150. Hmm. So that that's also the standard paint job. I hear you and your new best friend ran off to play in the woods together. You want to waste your time and energy on a race that can't do you any good? Fine, whatever. It's your call. It's not going to put food on the table. You best keep that in mind. And that's why Wade is an asshole. Because he can only think about the money. <laughs> well. And he gets jealous every time you beat one of his records. Yeah, our race just took us across the Northern Rockies. And that was Salt Lake City in the background. All right, but I think that's enough of the, uh, you know, the rally races for now.
There are a couple new street races that dropped, so let's have a look at them. Ooh. And of course, for American cars in the Midwest, there's only one vehicle I could possibly race for this. Um... Not the Porsche, of course. Hmm. Okay, where is it? I've got a ton of street race cars. It's got to be on here somewhere. It's not near the back, that's obvious. Where the hell did I put it? Uh, well, there... Oh, here it is. Just press X, there's the filters. Oh, oh. <sighs> this is a... This is, uh. And of course, for a street race called American Cars in the Midwest, while racing a Hummer and an American flag paint job, there's only one bit of music I could possibly have put in the background. One. Oh. Drive like it means something. Stars and stripes forever, baby. Yeah. What's that? Is there a car in front of me? I didn't even notice. Uh, oh crap, there was a turn. I noticed that. This is a lot. <laughs> All right. This is a very uh, bullheaded driving style. <laughs> I figured that's on brand. <laughs> well, there's really all, no other way to race this thing because you're not going to be able to turn it. That's for sure. Oh crap! If any car would be able to get through th those uh, steel barriers, I feel it would be this thing. Yeah. Well, luckily, they're invulnerable, so... It's very lucky. Also, I... I can't stop hating this thing. I'm sorry. This is too ugly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I also made sure to pick the worst possible parts when I was modding it. Oh, look at that rainbow. Yeah. Like, this is another one of the races where they uh, change the at the uh, the weather and the time of day. Yeah. And they really uh, did a good job with it. Especially by making sure that the uh, rainbow, you would be pointed at the rainbow throughout most of the race. I do appreciate it. Also, a lot of uh, corn and wheat fields out here. Oh, yeah. The most American crop, of course. It's everywhere. It's in everything. Mm-hmm. We even use it as a cheap replacement for sugar. Ah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I once had an American Pepsi, and I, uh... I didn't want to take more than one sip. Really? Yeah. Not a fan of fructose. I... yeah. I... I much prefer the sodas I have back home. By the way, I don't think you've said where home is, in case you wanted to tell it, the folks at home. Oh, I should probably... yeah. Uh... I'm from Iceland. Oh, crap. Uh, just to point out, but if you hit the left and right bumper at the same time, you reset back on the racetrack. So if you get way off track, then it is it can save you a little time as opposed to climbing back onto the road. But it usually puts you behind some of the other racers, so it's not something you should do. It, it's not something you can you really use for cheating. I think this might be the scariest race you've run yet. In terms of what? In terms of the poor other racers? In terms of, I know that if you make one false move, you're going to crash into something very hard. Yeah. And I know that the car will survive. I don't know about its occupants. Oh, yeah. by, by the way, did you notice the red line is at 3600 RPM? Huh. And 
here's me going over the ledge. Well, it is a truck. Yeah, but even the trucks that I drove earlier have higher red lines. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta love that it th this thing just sort of rolls over the uh, the metal verge there. <laughs> Well, there is one more new street race, so let's go ahead and see that. Oh boy. Along the Mississippi. Well, I think I've got something appropriate for this race, too. Ah, here it is. Uh, <laughs> is this one of those, uh... Yeah. Huh. How do you get your hands on a rat rod nowadays? Well, this is from the Proto brand, which from what I can tell is the fake brand that the developers created for when they wanted a no-brand car. Ooh. Also, only one song appropriate for something Let's modded like this. Nice. So... Oh, shit. Oh, um... I have no idea what just happened. Yeah, yeah, that that sure was a physics. <laughs> yeah, I tapped a car and flew off into the stratosphere. Wait a minute. This isn't the Hot Rod Herman remix. No, it's the, um... It is an instrumental version of the original Dragula that I found on YouTube. Ah. Well, we'll see how copyright goes with that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so yeah, I've got myself a uh, basically a 1920s car. It's been modded to hell. It has some of the most mods of any vehicle in the game. I mean, that's sort of the freedom you get when you're creating your own vehicles. Oh, yeah. So, uh, how many protos are there? Oh, there are quite a few, especially in some of the, uh... Some of the race types that don't really have a lot of official sponsors making cars for them, or other vehicles. Mm -hmm. Like, jet sprinting has a lot of protos. Huh. Because, from what I can gather, jet sprint boats tend to be, like, individually modded for the, for the race type. Huh. And, uh, interesting note, this vehicle is not only easier to control than the Hummer, but also easier than the, uh, than the ancient Ford, uh, Ford Mustang. Alright. But on the other hand, I have got this thing on 280 performance level, the highest possible, and I am competing on even ground with these guys on the easy race difficulty. Oh. So it kind of tells you the limits of the chassis, right there. Yeah, I guess. Uh, there's only so much you can do, do when you're working with that kind of old tech. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of fascinating how relatively easy this is to maneuver. Especially on wet pavement. Yeah. I think we're passing a um, nuclear power plant right now. Ooh. There are a couple of those on the map. Nice. Never been close by one of those. I'd love to see one. Not much you can really see. Most of the stuff is on, you know, restricted land. Oh, dang. That is the Mississippi on the right there. Yeah. Just goes on and on. Yeah. 
one of the longest rivers in the world. And it would be the longest if you counted from the beginning of the Missouri River. Uh. This thing, it, it definitely has a look. <laughs> yeah, the, the skull headlights. I think that's a nice touch. Yeah. Wait, what? Oh, oh. I hadn't even noticed those. Holy crap. Yep. Skull paint job. Cow skull on the uh, front bumper. It's pretty nice. Today's movie is the request of Patron Cronish. Cronish wants me to take a look at the best of the original Mad Max trilogy, a film titled The Road Warrior. You might think of it as a preview to Fury Road, but when it came out in 1981, it was just a good old-fashioned action movie. The story about the story. I've never really discussed Australian cinema before, so let me start with that. Australia is an immigrant nation, so it shares more in common with the United States than it does with post-colonial nations like Vietnam or the Congo. As such, Australia has been a relatively free and democratic nation ever since the United Kingdom started sending criminals there in 1788. Australia became a fully independent nation in 1901, and the first Australian feature film came out five years later, in 1906. Since then, the nation has had a fairly strong cinematic tradition, although it's been largely overshadowed by Hollywood and London productions. Still, a lot of famous actors have come from Australia during every generation, and movies like Babe, Moulin Rouge, and Crocodile Dundee were born on this continent. Such is also the case of Mad Max, a dystopian movie released in 1979 by director George Miller and producer Byron Kennedy, and it was the film that would launch the lead actor Mel Gibson's career. The film was about a police officer living in a small Australian town as society around him is in the middle of breaking down. Lawless gangs are running rampant through the countryside, and Mad Max Rakatansky is keeping the peace by chasing down thugs in a modded 1973 Ford Falcon GT. Incidentally, the Falcon was an all-Australian sports car, designed and built by Ford's plant in Australia. Mad Max is an ugly film full of violence, rape, murder, torture, and revenge. By the end of it, the gang has killed Max's wife and child, and Max has killed the whole gang in revenge. The movie got a mixed reception, but it earned $100 million internationally on a $400,000 budget. It's no real surprise, then, that Miller, Kennedy, and Gibson would spend the next two years creating a sequel to Mad Max, titled Mad Max 2 in its native Australia, and The Road Warrior in the United States. The story is completely different, and it takes place after global society has completely finished collapsing. Max is still the protagonist, but he is now a broken man after what happened to him in the first movie. On the other hand, he does still have that 1973 Falcon GT. The Road Warrior got much more positive reviews from critics, but it had more trouble reaching American audiences. A big reason for that was distribution problems. American International Pictures was an independent distributor that had worked with Roger Corman back in the 50s and 60s, but by the early 80s they were having financial troubles and got sold off to a TV and film producer called Filmways. But Filmways wasn't doing too hot either, and they got bought up by Orion Pictures. Mad Max 2 got lost in the shuffle, and eventually it ended up with Warner Brothers. Warner changed the film's name to The Road Warrior, because the first film wasn't that popular in North American theaters. But the sequel did better, and earned $34.9 million from the United States alone. Because of this success, the third film, Beyond Thunderdome, would retain the Mad Max title. So would the fourth movie in the series, which came out 30 years later. It took George Miller a long time to get Beyond Thunderdome. While I would definitely say that Fury Road is a better movie, and it shares a lot of common elements with The Road Warrior, I would also say that The Road Warrior is still worth watching on its own merits. So let me tell you why by explaining... The story. The movie starts with a narrator, explaining that the world ran out of petroleum during the Cold War, and every nation descended into chaos as the infrastructure collapsed. 
gangs took over and performed terrible acts just to survive. And after his family died in the first movie, Max became a shell of a man who wandered out into the wasteland. Sure enough, the movie proper begins with an action scene of Max running from a motorized gang. He outdrives the bad guys in his Ford Falcon, and when the last one tips over, he grabs his fuel can and jumps out to salvage what he can from its leaking gas tank. He doesn't react when the surviving driver pulls a bolt out of his arm and screams at him, and all he does when he sees a dead guy in a truck is grab a music box out of his hand. Later on, Max comes across a tiny gyrocopter randomly sitting in the middle of the outback. It looks abandoned, but when Max gets closer, its owner jumps out of a sand pit and points a crossbow at him. He wants Max's gas, but Max tells him it's booby-trapped. The man doesn't let that stop him, but when he opens the Falcon's door, Max's dog jumps out at him. At this point, the man instantly becomes a coward and promises to tell Max where to find thousands of gallons of gasoline if he'll simply let him live. Around 20 miles away is an old oil pump and refinery where people still process fuel. There's too much heat around it for the gyrocopter pilot, but he figures Max is tough enough to get in and get some fuel. So Max drives the two of them to the refinery, but ties the pilot up so that he can't cause trouble. As they observe the refinery, the pilot explains that it's been under siege for at least a week, and Max recognizes a couple gang members from the group that harassed him earlier. The pilot asks to go free at this point, but instead, Max ties him to a tree and keeps watching the siege. That night, the besiegers make camp, and the next morning, three cars leave the refinery compound and go in three different directions. The besieging gang quickly pursues them, and so they don't see when a fourth car heads out in a fourth direction. Max keeps track of the fourth car, and eventually the gang notices it and chases it down. The occupants are a man and a woman, and after shooting the man, the gangsters start raping the woman. Most of the gang leaves afterwards, so Max races down in his car. He's too late to save the woman, but he's at least able to take revenge and bring the man back to the compound since he's only wounded. Max does demand gas for payment first, however. Unfortunately, the man dies when they reach the compound, and the people there are too hostile to honor his deal. However, before they can kill Max, or send him away, the gang comes back and the compound locks down. The gang has all the surviving compound drivers tied to their cars, and after his toady introduces him, we hear a speech from Lord Humongous. The guy is wearing a black leather gimp suit and a steel hockey mask, and let's just say that it doesn't stand out from the rest of the gang's fashion sense. Humongous chastises the compound dwellers for trying to get around the gang to find a big rig truck that can pull their tanker trailer, since if they had that, they'd be able to leave the compound for good. Humongous tells them that he'll spare their lives if they just walk away from the refinery, and he gives them a day to decide. The people in the compound start arguing about whether or not to take Humongous' offer, but then Max speaks up. He saw a semi-truck in good condition during the opening car chase, and he can solve their problem and earn himself some fuel by helping them get it. They work out the details that evening, and when night falls, Max and his dog sneak past the gang with a few full gas cans. The next morning, they encounter the pilot, whom Max had left tied up, and the two head back to the pilot's gyrocopter. They use most of the gas Max brought to fuel the copter, and that gets them to the semi. Once he gets it running, Max again leaves the pilot behind, but this time he sets him free first. Nevertheless, the pilot follows on his gyrocopter, mostly because he wants his share of the reward. On the way back, Max has to drive past the gang blockade. They take out a few tires, and Humongous uses a precious bullet to shoot the engine, but he only gets the radiator, and Max manages to drive into the compound. Several gang members follow him in, but eventually they get chased off or killed. The pilot lands in the compound too, having done a few things to help. That night, Lord Humongous intimidates the compound by killing his captives on the ridge and ranting all night long, and Max gets ready to leave. The pilot tries to convince a young and pretty member of the compound to sneak away with him, but instead she convinces him to stay. 
The compound leaders ask Max to drive the rig, and they promise to bring him along for the 2,000 mile drive to the coastline that they're planning. But they push him too far, and Max punches one of them. He leaves just before sunset, but the gang catches up to him using nitrous oxide, and they hit Max until he rolls his falcon. Max crawls away in time to avoid the gang, but they kill his dog, and then they set off his booby trap, blowing up the car and all of its fuel. Fortunately, the pilot spots the smoke clue and rescues Max. Max is in bad shape after the crash, but he recovers in time to volunteer for driving the big rig. With his car gone, he's got no hope of surviving on his own now, so they let him help and they give him all the spare shotgun shells they've got. And the next morning, the compound breaks out and splits up. Max and a small escort will protect the tanker truck, and the rest of the dwellers will use this school bus and other vehicles to make their escape in other directions, and meet up at a chosen rendezvous point. The plan for this escape works, and the gang focuses completely on the big rig. The last 20 minutes or so is one long chase scene between Max and the humongous gang. Max and the guards on the truck whittle down the gang one vehicle after another, but the guards get whittled down too, and there aren't nearly as many of them. With the guards gone, the gang members start climbing onto the rig and attacking Max directly, and they start taking out the tires again. They even shoot down the gyrocopter, which was a part of their escort. Eventually, Lord Humongous rams the truck in a head-on collision, and while his makeshift vehicle evaporates from the crash, it does force the truck off the road and off its tires, at which point we see that the tanker is full of sand. The refinery people hid all their actual fuel in the bus and the passenger cars. Max manages to survive the crash and discover this fact, and the gyro pilot also turns out to have survived. But while the pilot meets up with the compound group and becomes their new leader, Max chooses to stay behind in the wastes. And that is how the movie ends. The Cars There was a lot of off-road driving in the game today, and there was a lot of off-road driving in the movie. So I figured the most appropriate car discussion to have today is off-road vehicles. And off-road vehicles are easy enough to understand, because I can sum it all up for you in a single word. Grip. Every land vehicle in the world moves you around by pushing against the ground. Your feet do this for every single step you take. And as you might have noticed if you've ever tried running across a patch of ice, you're not going to move anywhere if you don't have any grip. Asphalt and other road surfaces offer a solid, flat, dry surface that gives you all the traction you need without creating so much friction that it slows you down. However, other surfaces aren't nearly so kind. Dirt and sand are loose, so when your tires push against it, they tend to push the dirt out of the way instead of pushing the car forward. The water on wet surfaces can actually hold the car's weight, kind of, when the car is moving fast enough. And when that happens, it's called hydroplaning. Hydroplaning is really bad, because water has much less friction than solid surfaces, and you will instantly lose control of your vehicle. This is also what happens with ice, because when you put pressure on ice, it creates a thin layer of liquid water that refuses to give you any grip at all. Then there's snow, which combines the worst traits of dirt and ice, and mud, which combines water and dirt. Another thing, when you go way off the beaten path, you can end up with surfaces that aren't even remotely flat. Sand dunes and muddy slopes are much harder than flat surfaces to cross because you need extra power and extra grip to get up that slope. And then you need extra grip and control to go down a steep slope. Then there are rocky riverbeds and forests where fallen trees cross the path. And to get across these terrains, you need grip, power, control, tires that won't pop easy, and an undercarriage that won't get disemboweled by sharp rocks or broken branches. And so true off-road vehicles come with all of these things. The idea of an off-road vehicle goes back much farther than the automobile does. 
carts and carriages are older inventions than the paved road. And in certain times and places, carts would create roads by killing the grass along the path that a farmer would always take. The reason paved roads came around is because dirt roads would start getting ruts. And a rut can kill your cartwheels if they get deep enough. So people built carts and carriages that could handle a rough trail, and way before the first horseless carriage ever showed up, inventors came up with stuff like a flexible suspension, brakes, and durable iron-plated wheels that could take whatever a trail threw at them. Today's automobiles use basically all the same elements as the horse-drawn carts that came before them, but all of those elements are a lot more advanced than they were before. Of course, the first and most important thing is grip, and for grip, we have to look at the tires. Now, tires for racing vehicles, specifically ones that race on closed tracks, are smooth. Why? Because smooth tires have the most surface area possible in contact with the ground, and therefore, they give you the best grip. Your average car's tires aren't smooth, they have treads, and that's also because they need grip. Remember hydroplaning? Hydroplaning is more likely when the tires are smooth and the ground is smooth, because then you only need a thin layer of water to separate the two. Treads channel water away from the tire surface, and they also help with loose dirt and sand by adding surface area and giving the tires more opportunities to grip the dirt. Normal cars have treads because drivers might have to drive in the rain or in the snow, and they might want to drive on the dirt. Winter tires have extra treads to give you a better grip in bad conditions, and summer tires have fewer treads to give you a better grip in good conditions. Off-road tires have deep treads to give you the best grip in terrible conditions. So then, above the wheels is the suspension. Cars have a suspension to protect the wheel axles from getting damaged by sudden bumps, and to keep the passengers from feeling those bumps. A few too many bumps can really do a number on your spine. Off-road vehicles expect to hit a lot of big bumps, and so off-road suspensions make protecting the axle their priority. That's why off-road vehicles aren't really known for offering a comfortable ride, with a few notable luxury options as the exception. Off-road vehicles also tend to have something called a locking differential. Pretty much every modern car comes with a differential, a thing that lets the wheels on the same axle spin independently. You need this because when you turn, the wheels on the inside move slower than the wheels on the outside. If they had to move at the same rate, you'd lose grip, and I think you know how bad that is. On the other hand, because of this differential, if one of the wheels starts slipping, then all of the engine torque will go to that spinning wheel, leaving none for the tire with grip. A locking or limited slip differential lets you lock the axle and force the engine to give both wheels the same amount of power. You wouldn't use this for ordinary driving, but it does come in handy for deep mud puddles and sand pits. Of course, off-road vehicles also usually come with four-wheel or all-wheel drive. And thanks to automated systems, these drivetrains can handle a lot of the same torque control you get from a locking differential. Then there are skid plates. Skid plates are easy to understand. They're basically a set of steel armor plates that protect the undercarriage from rocks and other debris. Next is ground clearance and approach angles. Sports cars are built close to the ground because that gives them better downforce. Downforce is important because if you drive too fast with too little downforce, you can end up flying right up off the ground. When that happens, you lose grip, and we all know how important grip is. But being low to the ground means that you can't drive up on a curb without hitting your front bumper, and you could even get stuck on a steep driveway. Off-road vehicles have to face a lot worse than that, and so they benefit from having extra ground clearance and a bigger approach and departure angle. The way that you measure those numbers is by checking the angle between the base of the tires and the overhang of the bumpers. Bigger angles let you drive the car up steeper ramps. Another important feature is water fording. The average on-road car can get swept away by as little as one foot of water. But an off-road car can tackle two, even three. And for our metric friends, that's about a meter of water. 
Now engines need air to run, and they need traction to move, so off-road cars have ways to waterproof engines and help the tires dig in even in deep water. For that matter, you can get an engine snorkel that pulls air in from above the car roof and uses it to power the engine so that it can wade through even deeper rivers. There's a whole bunch more I could say about electronic traction and braking systems, but maybe that can be in a future corner. I think I've gone on for enough today. So thanks for joining me again for today's movie and car review. I hope I'll see you next time for an anime movie about sci-fi street racing. And no, it's not Initial D, sorry.